All right, good morning, everyone, and welcome to our concurrent se session today, The Ped Pedagogical Power of Podcasts, Leveraging Pre-Existing Podcasts and the Value of Student-Created Podcasts. Our presenters today are Garth Neufeld and Eric Landrum of the Psych Sessions Podcast. Garth Neufeld is a professor of psychology at Cascadia College and faculty in residence of the college's Teaching and Learning Academy. He is the founder of Teaching Introductory Psychology Northwest and Teaching of Psychology Incubator Workshop and co-founder of the Psych Sessions Podcast and the Psychology Network. He has served the national teaching of psychology community through various leadership roles through Society and Teaching of Psychology, the AP Psychology Reading and APA's Educational Directorate and is a co-editor of the upcoming APA book, Transforming Introductory Psychology, Expert Advice on Teaching, Training, and Assessing the Course. In 2018, Garth was awarded a Citizen Psychologist Presidential Citation from the APA for co-founding Shared Space for All, and an organization that educates and mentors at-risk Thai children toward the prevention of prostitution. He is also the recipient of the 2019 STP Wayne Wheaton Teaching Excellence Award. Eric Landrum is a professor and chair in the Department of Psychology, Psychological Science at Boise State University, receiving his PhD in Cognitive Psychology from Southern Illinois University, Carbondale. He is a research generalist broadly addressing the improvement in learning, including the long-term retention of introductory psychology content, skills and assessments, improving help-seeking behavior, advising innovations, working to understand student career paths, the psychology workforce, successful graduate school applications, and many more. If you have any questions for the presenters during the session, please feel free to enter those into the Q&A section at the bottom of the Zoom room screen, and we'll address them at the end of the talk. On that note, I'm gonna hand it over to our presenters. Well, good morning, everybody. We're thrilled to be here. Um, one of the things, a uh, couple of things, uh, maybe housekeeping tips. Uh, we'll be happy to share our slides. We're going to give you um, uh, our email addresses on the very last slides. We'll share them with Brian and with Hawks Learning. Uh, many of our slides uh, have reference materials, so please don't panic if we skip over slides. Uh, we didn't mean to go over them anyway. They're just kind of our citations or our annotations to give credit where credit is due. I'm really thrilled to be here this morning with Garth, and I think he's going to kick us off. So, Garth. Yeah, well, Eric, I'm just glad you didn't give your full bio because uh, we could have been here all day. Um, so, well, that's very okay. So, first off, thank you for saying that, and that kind of sets the tone for what this is. So, for the presenters who don't know us, uh, Garth and I are dear friends, and so uh, here we go. Oh man, yes. Um, well, I'm really excited to be here. Um, it's a little early in Seattle, but I was quite happy to wake up and. Uh, and, uh, and, and do this this morning, uh, because uh, it's not every day you get to talk about something that you're really passionate about to other people who show up because they are also interested in it. And, um, and so we hope, uh, we hope that this will be really helpful to you. Um, Eric and I have given talks uh, together before and uh, talked about what is the purpose of a talk like this. And if you can't take one thing away from this talk, then I don't think we've, we've done our jobs. And that one thing may be, that was nice and hopefully entertaining, but uh, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not ready to take that next step. Uh, but we hope you will, and we hope that you will find something. I should just say, my daughter is getting ready behind this wall um, for her online school today, so we're all working from home, and hopefully that won't get in the way. Um, she's eight, and she's about to go back to the classroom, which is fantastic. Well, and the beauty of um, having two presenters is that I can kick in if you need to step away <laughs> and take care of her, and so I would be more than happy to do that because she is a lovely young lady. <laughs> all right, well, uh, this... Uh, this Psych Sessions podcast that we do can be found on uh, re really all of the, the podcast hosting sites. So whether Spotify or Apple or wherever you find your podcasts. And um, the story is really neat. We tell it in Psych Sessions uh, on an early episode about how we got this going. Um, and, and it's been a great love of uh, uh, and a part of our kind of, for me, middle career and for Eric, a little later uh, career. But, uh, you know, we've, we've been at it for 
you know, five years or so. And I got to tell you, it has been the best thing. And uh, now we are to the point where we can bring these things into a classroom and we know what we have uh, on our hands. We used to, at one point in time, we were just having conversations with people that we really liked and found interesting. And now we're realizing what kind of utility there is with the podcast, uh, well, with podcasts generally, and then also our podcast specifically. And if I can just add while, while going to the next slide, uh, the podcast is a resource much like this conference. It's completely free and uh, it's available to you and it's a resource. And so instructors who might be thinking about freshening up their course or they're looking for new ways to have, engage students with the materials, like Garth said at the beginning, I, I think we're going to give you some good ideas that you might take away from this, which are going to be completely free. Yeah, um, thanks, Eric, for that. We we want to just show you uh, from the Pew Research Center. They they pull this data every year, and it's actually really interesting to look through. Uh, we first started looking through this data five years ago, and you can see from 2016 that um, all of the uh, uh, me measure points that they have um, they have um, followed and and collected over those years have increased. So. Uh, have people ever listened to a podcast? Have they listened to one in the past month? And have they listened to one in the past week? The numbers are ever increasing. Eric, do you have any other kind of thoughts about uh, what we're seeing in this trend? Well, I, I think if we, you know, there, there's other layers here. Um, uh, younger adults are, are tending to be more open and engaging with podcasts than some older adults, although older adults will engage more in things like uh NPR type podcast, This American Life, things like that. Um, a lot of times <clears throat> there might be people who just haven't figured out podcasts. And so uh, they're either afraid of the technology or unknown or, or not knowing about the technology. And so it, it seems to be a very uh, divided audience. Either people are uh, hardcore podcast listeners or they it's very foreign to them. So it's, it's usually either one end of the spectrum or the other. Yeah, and I would argue that uh, one of the we're, we're going to make the case that you you should consider it, uh, podcasting as a, a, an item in your toolbox, a, a tool that you could use in your classroom, but also uh, that you could use to produce material. And I think these numbers um, they they help support. Uh, you know, what we're doing today, which is to say people are, students are listening to podcasts. And so how can we meet them there pedagogically? Um, so the the idea that I want to offer, essentially the way this is going to go is, is I'm going to offer you um, a way that I do this and Eric's going to bring it even uh, uh, kind of more into the classroom and show you how he does this um, with students as creators um, and, and um, not consumers. Um, so that's kind of going to be the rest of the talk. So let me just talk about how to use podcasts. Now, like I've said, this is a tool. This is not a. This is not your magic bullet um, that's going to solve everything for you in terms of student learning. It's something to be leaned upon. And um, whenever I am adopting, I'm not quick to adopt new technology or new ideas for my courses. I really want to see them. Uh, like one of my biggest, uh, I think. I don't know. One of my biggest regrets is when I put a ton of time and energy into something and it doesn't turn out and I don't end up using it. And so when I have a new idea um, for bringing something into my course or hear somebody else talk about, first of all, does it energize me? So am I going to enjoy this? And then what kind of time is this going to cost me? Uh, to implement. And then finally, um, I, a question for me and Eric, I think you'll agree. Can I double dip this somewhere? So if I'm putting the time into this here for my course, is it going to pay off somewhere else as well? And so there are so many good options out there when you search for psychology podcasts. Um, there are also lots of not good options out there when you search for psychology <laughs> podcasts, both in terms of content and in terms of quality. There are some, some podcasts that have great content and the quality is so bad, and we're going to talk about that, that at the end, um, that students are not going to be engaged to listen to them. Um, and then we have the, the other problem as well. And so uh, it will take some practice to, to look at that. Here's some of our favorites. Um, I didn't put all the trashy ones that I love to listen to on a regular basis on here. We, we tried to, you know, look prim and proper. Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah. But these ones, uh, you know, in my category, I've used these uh, clips from these in my classes, uh, particularly abnormal psychology, um, intro psych, whether that when when it's appropriate. Um, that's just got so much content in it already. Um, I also found Department 12 is an IO psychology uh, podcast that I learned about when I started teaching IO psych um, recently. And, and so these are great supports. They're great tools. So how do you use these? Um, I'll sh I'll, 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 I'm going to show you three clips from our um, podcast that I think help us go beyond the traditional textbook um, that they they let us go uh, deeper in a particular area and maybe allow us to leverage what's going on in the real world authentically outside of the classroom uh, into conversations. Um, you, if, if you've been around psychology, and maybe even if you haven't, you've probably heard of uh, psychologist Albert Bandura. He's one of the most famous psychologists. He, he is 95 years old right now. Um, and I had the opportunity to visit him and, and interview him last year. And he is the psychologist who developed the Bobo doll experiment. And essentially what that turned into is in a world where people didn't think that violence could be observed and learned and modeled, uh, he said, let's not, uh, let's not throw out that environmental influence. So I was asking him about what it was like to go to Congress in the 1950s and argue his position, a scientific position um, on this. So um, I'm hoping this will work. Uh, let's just jump in right here. Assassinated. They had a huge movement to try to study the causes of violence in society. The networks decided that they would uh, 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 kill my reputation. So uh, the Surgeon General is acting as though Rome was burning and Bandura is the fire extinguisher. I mean, it was really bad. Um, were you ups Did this upset you at the time? Because now you're laughing about it, but was it upsetting? Well, sure as hell. I'm a untenured professor, and this is appearing in, in TV columns and newspapers and so on. So something, a, a clip like this that I, I would bring into the classroom, you could talk about careers. You could talk about um, bringing science to the public. I think that is a connection that we could, uh, we could make right now with the pandemic. And we're always looking for ways to do this. Well, this is an old conversation, right? Uh, Bandura was doing this in the 1950s and, um, and he was getting put through the fire over it. Um, you know, Elizabeth Law- I begin to- uh... Sorry, let's try that again. Um, I think I'm gonna have to do that. I begin to. Elizabeth Loftus is uh, maybe the most famous living uh, memory researcher. Um, and she is the, the most cited uh, woman in introductory psychology textbooks. Um, and I had a conversation with her about whether her, um, whether some of her ideas like the misinformation effect have stood up and uh, the scrutiny of time uh, and replication. How have those early findings stood up over time for you? I imagine pretty well. There are probably now hundreds, thousands, it's hard to know, studies of, of the misinformation effect showing that new information that enters uh, your consciousness after some event is over can change uh, uh, what you remember, can alter, contaminate, transform your memory. Um, so I, I think that that misinformation effect has certainly stood up pretty well. I like talking about Elizabeth Loftus because in an introductory psychology course, um, which I teach a lot of, um, there are not a lot of uh, female psychologists that um, are are chosen to be part of, uh, you know, the 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 guts of the book and and the research. And so, to to highlight Elizabeth Loftus and her wonderful work is 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 really uh, a gift for the for the students. And we're for those of us who are trying to bring equity, diversity, and inclusion into our classrooms. Um, you know, these also offer uh, you the opportunity to do that. Um, Arthur Evans Jr. is the CEO of the American Psychological Association which is a small city, um, really. It's 125,000 members. 
he's got this unbelievable story. It was so fun to talk about to him about it. Um, one of the things that he's done is he's lobbied in Washington, D.C. He lobbied before he was the CEO. Um, and, and now, um, a, as he is the CEO of APA, one of his jobs is to give the research, give the science. Um, I asked him about where he stands on social justice and psychology, and this was his answer. Uh, even though I would never use the language of social justice in my government positions, because while many psychologists are comfortable with that language, many people in the political arena are not. Right. And um, uh, and that terminology can get misinterpreted. So uh, I never use that language to describe my work. However, my work was clearly about social justice. Yeah, it's so interesting. I love that uh, a little clip from Arthur Evans Jr. It reminds me how subversive psychology can be sometimes, psychological science, and how we can uh, really affect change and make the world a better place uh, and not be quite on the nose about it. We can come in through the side door. And uh, I like to talk to my students about, about the, the uh, positive effects psychology can have on our world. So um, there's lots of different ways to use these. And these are just three examples. Eric. And Garth, if I can just add on to a couple of things here. First off, I, I love the examples that you chose because I think it shows the power of adding on to whatever textbook you're using. If you're using a Hawks text or whatever, you can augment those stories. You know, an author on the written page can only do so much. But to hear from these folks in their own words uh, is just a really added layer. Uh, for example, in our back catalog of sessions, uh, we have an interview with Phil Zimbardo, for example, and so uh, a number of other famous psychologists and, and a bunch of people who are teachers of psychology as well. And secondly, I just want to add, uh, there are interviews in our psych sessions catalog where I'm part of them as well. So I'm glad that Garth selected three that he is the author of, and Garth, as you, as you will find out if you listen, is an amazing interviewer. And I'm glad he chose the three that he did because they really are outstanding. Are you a part of this podcast? Yeah, I, yeah. I, I, I think I wrote the initial check or part of the check. I don't know. And, you know, funding is important, Garth. Let's be, <laughs> let's be clear about that. Um, one of the things that we promised in the abstract is that uh, we would try to show how that you can use podcasts, either snippets in a classroom or student-centered assignments to connect to real world skills and abilities. And we're not going to have a lot of time to dig deep into this, but I want to show you some data that was generated by Heart Research Associates, but sponsored by the American Association for Colleges and Universities. And uh, thankfully, uh, Garth is uh, controlling the slides in Seattle while I'm speaking in Boise. So I'm going to ask him to go, oh, look at that. He's already figured it out. Uh, when they did a national survey of CEOs and uh, human resource managers, uh, and this happens to be the data from the executives, uh, and they rated these 15 skills and abilities, you can see which ones are rated important and where college students rate. Uh, the importance ratings are the gold circles and the uh, how they believe college students are arriving in their organizations are the blue circles. The point that I want to make here really quickly is that um, if you think about practicing oral communication skills, if you think about practicing putting together a script, uh, you know, that's a complex skill set to be able to record, to use technology, to edit, to speak, to speak clearly, to be, speak persuasively. So an assignment that seemingly might be record a two to three minute podcast uh, that's a persuasive message about something in psychological science write a script for it and then record it. it might sound like something really straightforward, but you might actually be able to hit on four or five or six student learning outcomes um, over time after you've practiced it by developing some rubrics. And so I wanna spend maybe the next 10 or 12 minutes talking to you about that. And then we wanna leave the remainder of our time really for some audience discussion, some Q and A, whatever we can do to help you think about how you might implement this. And the other thing we, I want to flip back to is that I love Garth's notion of how can I double dip? Because if you're going to spend the time thinking about this, I also think there are some benefits to thinking about, well, if I'm going to learn about podcasting techniques, might I use that technology in understanding, let's say, microphones to improve the voiceovers that I'm doing for recorded podcasts? 
since I had to make the grand pivot in March of 2020. So we can talk about that as well. By the way, the next slide that you're seeing right here, I'm not going to talk about. It's just kind of giving the reference citation for the slide that we just showed you earlier. So I want to talk a little bit about how I use um, and have been using for, I'm going to say about 10 years, even before Garth and I started the Psych Sessions podcast, how I've been using a podcast assignment in a number of different courses in the undergraduate curriculum. I actually have a three column table that I've, I've used in my syllabus a number of times, Garth, thank you, um, where um, I actually outline it for my students about the script and the podcast assignment with the student learning outcome and I tell them how I'm going to assess it. Uh, and I think uh, you can use this in large classes and uh, you just have to be careful about managing the workload. Um, you know, thinking about backward course design can be really helpful. Um, you know, what's going to be the assessment? You know, what's the student learning outcome? What's going to be the assessment technique? And then how am I going to actually teach it and deliver it is a really useful thing. And then I just try to be transparent about this and show students why we're doing it, how I'm going to grade it from their perspective, and then uh, teach them, you know, the basics of how to do it. And so when I do that, I, I break this down into two parts. I break it down into a script. I break it down into a podcast. And so uh, with the script part of the assignment, um, I can have them practice APA format. If you're not from uh, a psychology-based discipline, you might be concentrating on MLA if it's an English assignment. You might be concentrating on, if you're from biology, it might be the Council of Biology Editors or Turabian or Chicago Style Manual, whatever it might be, whatever style you want your students to practice in. Um, I, that also gives them a chance to practice with the details of Microsoft Word and attention to detail, um, wh whatever that side of that assignment is. But the podcast then gives them a chance to practice with oral communication skills, which um, we know from the employer data, um, is vitally important to being successful. Uh, it gives them a chance to practice with a technology skill that could be helpful to them in their future workplace. And it helps them with building confidence. And you know, if you've been in this business as long as I have, but it, as evidenced by the white beard and the lack of follicles, uh, what you oftentimes conclude is that our students can be highly skilled but have very low levels of confidence. And so giving them opportunities to practice and try and build confidence in something can be perhaps, can be sacrilegious here, almost as important or equally as important as uh, pouring in the content or practicing the skill, but gaining the confidence in themselves uh, can be very important. So what I try to do is I try to manage expectations and try to manage workload. So I don't have them record 10 or 60 minute podcasts. In my classes, I have them record two to three minute podcasts. And I'm really specific about that. It must be at least two minutes and it may be no more than three minutes because if I've got a class of 50 students, I've got to listen to all those and I've got to grade all of those. And I have a very specific rubric that I'm going to share with you. Also, if I make it that short, that means those papers are relatively short. I can tell you that um, a script read at a decent rate in the old APA format, double spaced, one inch margins, times New Roman 12 point font is about a page and a half. Add a cover page and references and it comes in at about four and a half or five pages times 50. That's still a lot of students, but that's doable in a semester. Um, they get to practice those skills, larger enrollment, it's doable. If you have the luxury of teaching assistance, it's even more doable. Um, high quality audio software is available for free in every platform for Windows, for Mac, for Linux. Um, and then um, rubrics, I, I use rubrics that I'm gonna show you are available to facilitate grading. Here's a screenshot of what I use in my classes. It's called Audacity. Um, there's the uh, URL at the top of the screen, uh, completely free. It's uh, open source software uh, available on all of those platforms. And this is actually high power software, um, ed audio editing software. And in fact, there are professional podcasts like the picture we showed you earlier on, from iTunes. There are professional podcasts that use this program uh, to edit their um, content. Uh, 
if you think about Microsoft Word, um, we use only certain tools as Word users, but you know there's a rich, full skill uh, tool set that's out there, but we only use a handful of things. Audacity is the exact same way. I only use two or three things when I edit in Audacity, but if you look at the tool set, it's amazing, it's incredible, but I, I only use the couple things that I use in that. Uh, there are uh, the rubrics, and so one of the benefits, I think, of giving away this PowerPoint is that we're also giving away, I'm giving away the rubrics. And of course, um, you know, almost like a rear view mirror, mirror, your results may vary. You would customize this if you were to ad adopt an assignment. And like Garth mentioned in his opening comments, I would suggest that you start small. Um, taking my rubric and just uh, taking it and adopting it for your classes might not work for you. It might not work with your learning goals. It might not work for your institution, but this might give you an idea of where to start if you didn't want to start from scratch. So these are the details of my script assignment and I, you know, the relative points and the things that I grade for. Uh, the next one are the uh, rubric details for the audio. And um, I, I know you can't see them together, but actually the audio portion is uh, worth more points than the script version, even though the text for the script was longer uh, than the text for the audio. And I go over with students, you know, to pay attention to that. Uh, the point values are, are uh, they're proportional, meaning things that are worth more points are more difficult to achieve. That's why they're worth more points. And so um, things like, um, did you follow the instructions, the recording quality, the uh, enthusiasm and persuasiveness, vocal clarity and articulation and enunciation. And by the way, in, in my courses where I do this, I give them examples of a, a script. I give them examples of a podcast recording that's two to three minutes. And so uh, they don't just have to guess about what I'm expecting. I try to give them examples of the good ones and bad ones, by the way. Uh, let's see, here are some example rubric reports that I have run in Blackboard, a really helpful feature. So that when I grade, I don't grade with a singular grade, I grade in this case, um, with audio recording, I would give four grades within the rubric, and then I can run a rubric report. And by the way, these are real data from the last time that I, I did this assignment. And when I present this assignment in my classes, I actually show the rubric report from the prior semester, the last time I gave that assignment. The benefit of that is that students can see where students in the prior semester struggled. So the red and blue gaps there, they can see the largest gap is where there is more struggle. Or in the lower uh, graphic, they can see that when students lost points, they lost it the most in, in the assignment details. So if they want to get the most points, they should know that they really need to study that section of the rubric. I show them the same thing for the, um, uh, the next one, which is the, this one, the script rubric outcomes, and you can look at the largest gap, and that's the th that third category, which is meeting the goals of the podcast script assignment. You can see that the distribution of A's, B's, and C's, and D's, and F's varies depending on the rubric category. Um, I just want to play now, and I'm going to ask um, Garth to do this. These are about 45 seconds each of two students' um, snippets that I sampled. Happy birthday to you, you got drunk and puked, your brain is now irreparably damaged. Happy birthday to you. 21st birthdays, a rite of passage for many college students who consume alcohol. A population that comprises 65 to 80 percent of college academics in the United States. A person would be hard pressed to find a college student who had not heard tales of a 21st birthday filled with bar hopping, heavy drinking, and some embarrassing incidents. The tradition of binge drinking to mark the 21st birthday is so prevalent that four out of every five college students celebrate their 21st birthday by drinking copious amounts of alcohol. Twenty twenty has been rocked by waves of protests turned riot and, as odd as it may seem, a debate regarding Black Lives Matter movement. This simple and accurate statement first created in response to Trayvon Martin's death in 2012 has reintroduced other movements such as defund the police, 
wherein advocates proposed the reallocation of funds from overinflated police programs to underrepresented social programs. But due to the opposition's unwillingness to accept Black Lives Matter as a movement, let alone as a factual statement, the Defund the Police movement has been dismissed by many as an offshoot of Black Lives Matter. There are those who attempt to invalidate the movement through the use of strawman fallacies, such as All Lives Matter, and blue lives matter. A straw man fallacy is characterized by the taking of another person's argument or point and distorting or exaggerating it, and then attacking the distortion, as if that is really the argument all along. So in this assignment, there are two to three minute podcasts and they pick a topic and they research it and their script has actual citations to support their arguments but they present it as a public service announcement. So they're using their psychological knowledge to make a point, but they have to make it persuasively in their podcast. And so I really like this assignment because uh, I get to hear their voices. They have to use psychological science. They have to have an APA formatted script. So they get to practice that written communication skill. Uh, these two students were in a class of 50 and as much as I love hearing their voices, um, hearing 50 oral presentations uh, becomes sadly, you know, for most students and honestly for most professors, a bit mind-numbingly boring after the first two or three. And so by having a podcast assignment, an audio assignment uploaded to Blackboard, I can grade those at my leisure. I can re uh, return detailed comments through that rubric, uh, through Blackboard, and uh, I, I really, um, cherish that opportunity to hear their voices and to hear what they're passionate about because they can pick anything they want to. They're not, they're not doing this for me. Uh, they get to pick what they want and they can overlap. So they can be, they can be, it's not that every student has to pick something unique. Uh, we're going to finish out here talking a little bit about audio quality and then open it up for our audience. Eric, thanks for sharing those. Um, I've never heard those before and I, I actually, I shouldn't be impressed, but I'm really impressed at the quality. I mean, that's that's a fantastic assignment. Um, Thank you. We'll have to talk more about that. Uh, we've never recorded you talking about that and put it out on the podcast, so we'll have to do that. <laughs> um, hey, folks, um, you know, I just want to end by just talking about audio quality, um, because this is one thing that we didn't know before we started, but now we are convinced, we're converted uh, that, that audio quality matters. Every other part of your course matters, right? Uh, the way that you design your course, the way that you uh, approach your outcomes and, and ba use backward design to create assessments and, um, and, and lectures and readings or whatever in order to, um, to, to reach those outcomes. Um, audio quality matters. It's, uh, it's important to learning. Imagine if we, uh, treat a video this way in our courses. You show up to your, your class and you, um, you, you stand in front of the, your, your students and you put on a video that you wanna show them and it's completely pixelated to the point that you can barely make out uh, the faces of people. We would never treat video that way. And I would argue that maybe to a bit of a lesser extent that we need to think about audio in the same way. You can lose audience with, and in this case, our students, you can lose them, um, especially right now when we're uh, teaching a lot more online. It seems like we're going to be continuing to do that in the future. You can lose them in a lot of ways. You know, you can lose them if, if your content is you know, too long, recorded content is too long. Uh, that can lose it, but also audio quality. So um, here is uh, just a few suggestions that we have um, to, to sharpen your audio game. And let me just say that you can get a very nice setup for your home or office. And I, I know this is a lot of money to many of us. Uh, and I, I do think it's worth the investment when you think about what else we spend money on. And, and I'm also going to push institutions for what institutions spend money on. Um, um, I think that $250 uh, for a faculty member is is reasonable. And so you can get a very, very nice audio setup. Um, and you know, we can talk later. You can email us about what that looks like, but for about $250. And um, I, I would like to see colleges step up and do this for faculty so that we can enhance our communication with students. So um, 
you know, you can learn through Audacity, YouTube videos of people using Audacity for editing. You can, that, that, that information is all there, but it is difficult to navigate. I mean, we've been at this for years and we've gone on some hunts to find answers to things. Um, and not everybody has a great answer. Um, a couple other um, uh, suggestions for enhancing your audio game. Um, Use clips and not long segments of audio. Um, you know, just as a general rule, that works better for students. Um, and you know, go for engagement. Go beyond the book. Use these as a tool in your toolbox to go beyond the book. Um, finally, um, teach your students about it. As Eric has suggested, this is a skill set that students can bring beyond the classroom to career to employment, it can give them a leg up on people um, who they are competing for with jobs. And I love that we're giving away skills and that is really near and dear to Eric's heart. And I'm, I'm so grateful that he's been on that campaign for so long. Um, so feel good. When, when I started using evidence-based pedagogical practices like sci uh, learning science, I felt really good as an instructor. I felt like I was giving my students what I wanted to give them, which is evidence-based practice, um, evidence-based technique. And um, I think that when it comes to dissemination and communication, we know uh, that good audio quality uh, is meaningful, um, if, if not only just for engagement. And so, uh, and so I would suggest that uh, we treat it the same way. All Garth, right. Garth, yeah, go let ahead. Me, let me just add really quickly before we open it up and before Brian helps us do that. Um, couple things. I would say the, the first level of upping your audio game can be done between $50 and $100, um, probably with a Logitech USB headset uh, that really goes well beyond relying on your laptop's uh, built-in audio um, microphone uh, and speakers. And then I think the next level is what you're talking about, about a $250 investment. So I, I I don't think it has to be that leap to that 250. I think it's a, I, as you know, I think it's a really good investment. Mm -hmm. But if people um, are choking a bit at that, I think that that first level is do, is more doable. And then, and then as you find yourself doing more powerpoints or voiceovers, um, I'm a department chair here at Boise State, and I just started buying them for faculty members who wanted them, and. Um, the quality difference is audible. I was going to say visible. The quality difference is audible. And you know, if you're on Zoom meetings all day long, uh, you want comfort, but you want to be able to be heard. You want to be able to easily mute yourself uh, with a good quality headset. You don't have to scramble to find the mute button on the screen because it's on your cord. Uh, you you know, there's all kinds of options and features that are worth what you pay for. What Garth's got displayed here are our email addresses, also our Twitter handles, if you're interested in such things. And um, soon after this meeting, we will be uh, providing this PowerPoint to um, the folks at Hawks, uh, or you can email us. And uh, you know what, if Hawks invites us back again someday, maybe we'll do an audio workshop um, for them at a future Hawks uh, IES. Totally, yeah, thanks. Awesome, thank you guys very much. Um, that was great and I think opened up a lot of things for everyone that I was able to attend today. We do have about uh, six or seven minutes for some Q and A's. Great. Uh, I'm gonna jump right into that if that's okay with you guys. Please. Perfect, Perfect. so one question we have right here, um, it seems like for a lot of people, podcasts are a new a new thing for a lot of people, and they are interested in, in incorporating them into their classes. And they are wondering if there was a specific podcast creating program that they have to download in order to create a podcast. Yeah, I think Eric, um, the Audacity um, link that Eric provided earlier. I I think that is the that's the one. It's it's really okay. excellent. Um, and uh, Eric, do you want to talk about any of the other ones that we've we've played with? Well, it's it, there's a couple of levels here. If you want to create an audio file, an MP3, Audacity will do it. And by the way, there are literally thousands of apps on the, uh, iTunes or Google Play. If you just want to create an an audio file, which is what my students do, they create an MP3 file. 
if you actually want to create a podcast that gets distributed through Apple Podcast or Google Podcast or Stitcher or Spotify, that's a whole different thing. And that's a whole, you, you, you have to create the MP3 file and distribute it. Uh, and that would be a whole different conversation. Um, yeah. And, you know, recording, and, and if you want to just distribute them to classes or something like that, there are options. Like you can record and export straight from uh, Zoom. You can record audio or audio conversation. And that's what a lot of major podcasts are doing right now uh, is they're using Zoom, but they're using it with really nice mics. That's the only difference between what you would be doing. And I mean, Howard Stern uses, I think, like a $5,000 mic or something like that. So, um, yeah, I, I, I also think that there are um, there are other options. It depends. I agree with Eric how deep you want to go. Um, I, I see the second question here, and Eric, I'm going to defer to you, which is, um, how is podcasting different than doing YouTube uh, presentations in terms of student learning potential? Um, I, I know what I would say, but I'd like to hear what you, you would say, because you have a YouTube channel. So tell me again what the question is. What's the difference between podcasting and YouTube in, in terms of students learning potential? I, I th you mean, if a student was creating a video and posting it to YouTube, I think you could, you know, a well-designed assignment could certainly uh, achieve student learning outcomes. And again, I, I you know, I, I, I wouldn't argue against uh, having uh, YouTube-based assignments. Um, again, I think it's all about the structure. Uh, you know, are, is the student uh, creating a script, for example? Are they, cre are, are they scripting it out? Are they doing a storyboard before they actually uh, film their, uh, their YouTube uh, video before uploading it? Uh, I, th I, think, I think the more thought that goes into it, uh, the better chance for real learning outcomes. Uh, by the way, on my list, uh, the psych the psych files of my list of podcasts, the psych files isn't a podcast; it's a YouTube series done by uh, Ali Matu, uh, which is one of my favorites. So I, I didn't acknowledge that, but I am now. Uh, so, and I think the benefit of thinking about something like a YouTube based assignment is that that's where students live, right? And so, if you're giving them an assignment, they can do using their phone and they're on their phone looking at YouTube, you're hitting them in a spot where they, where they live. And by the way, there are plenty of apps that are available that you could record MP3 files on their, on their phone as well. And Apple phones and Android phones these days have amazingly good microphones built in, by the way. And, and I'll just piggyback and just say that, you know, podcasting is just a different tool than YouTube is. And, and they're both Great. And um, in fact, uh, vlogs have taken off just like podcasts, which is just video podcasts um, or um, yeah. So, so really there is a lot of overlap there. I would say for students, um, you're going to find a lot more comfort students talking to a mic than being on camera. Uh, and I think we've all seen that in our classrooms as well. I, um, I guess the one thing I would piggy on the piggyback would be um, we have to be careful and, and, and not assume that all of our students are the digital natives that we sometimes think they are. So we have to be prepared to provide tech support. Um, some students are gonna be just uh, audacity experts beyond me. And some students are gonna fumble, bumble and stumble. And we just have to be able to, de to devote class time, uh, which I do, to showing them step-by-step, step, here's how you use it, here's how you do it. Here are some tutorials, just like I do when I teach SPSS, just like I do when I teach APA format. When yeah. you're teaching a skill, you can't assume that uh, anyone can just jump in and do it. And so whether it would be a YouTube edit, or YouTube post, or using Audacity, um, not everyone is at the same skill set. Not everyone has the same, you know, um, newest smartphone, iPhone 12, whatever, whatever. Uh, we have, yeah. It's not the same for everybody. Um, I know that we've just got a minute left. Uh, J Jacqueline, I, I'm reading your question here about how to actually do this. Yes, you've got it. I mean, this is exactly it. Um, you tell them the podcast name, you tell them the episode title and the time markers, clips that you want them to listen to, and you do it on any major platform. So yeah, well well done. That's that's it. You're ready. Um, I'm really interested in Caitlin's question, which is on on theme, narrowing down to a theme. I love this question because I know that out there, 
you, some of you have these great ideas. It's the coolest thing about podcasting is that anyone can do it and put it out there. And you're right. You need to come up with a great theme that you can talk about and engage people with. Um, and, but you gotta also gotta make sure there's an audience that's really as interested in that theme as you are. Uh, frequency of episodes. We've tried a lot of different things. We've done uh, bi-weekly uh, releases. So every two weeks is how we started. And now we've started spinoff series, like teaching series, um, where we are blasting out seven episodes as a series, kind of Netflix bingeable, think, think Netflix bingeable, where people can listen to them all at once. So we've got about, I don't know, six or so programs as part of the Psych Sessions network right now. Um, and they they're different. And, you know, we can talk more, Caitlin. Email us. Awesome. Thank you guys very much. And with that, we are unfortunately out of time right now. And thank you guys so much. That was great. And I know you informed all of us on a lot of great information here. So I'm going to quickly um, do a couple quick wrap up things that get moving into the next concurrent session. Uh, the first thing, thank you everyone for attending. I'm going to launch a quick poll just to get your feedback on the session and your time here at IES. Um, you'll see that it would probably take you less than a minute to complete. And then I'm also going to, in one moment, going to paste into the chat the links for the next concurrent session. So, And to be fair, I'm not going to answer the poll questions just to not skew the data. But I'll Thank answer you. them twice. <laughs> <laughs> mm. Oh, look at that. Host and panelists cannot vote. Look at that. They predicted a smart aleck like me might want to skew the data. That's cool. I wonder if they use this data to judge um, who gets invited back next year. Wouldn't it be weird if just one of us got invited back? It, it's going to be you. It's always the ponytail, damn it. It's always the ponytail. Oh, we don't, we don't call it ponytail in Seattle. What? Oh, man bun. Sorry. No, oh, I think that's old too, but I'm not quite sure. Okay, so that. what do you call it? In, I don't know what the kids are calling it these days. What do you call it in the land of uh, overcast skies? What, what is it called? <laughs> Thanks, everyone. <laughs>